Hello, hello, Miriam. Welcome to the Mom Force. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat with you today. I know I have so many questions for you, and I know our community is going to learn so much from you. Um, but as way of introduction, let's start with a photo question. Um, yes. Listen, I know I'm the mom of seven. I know that not every photo is as picture perfect as it might seem. There's often a very interesting backstory in that moment. Can you tell us about one of those photos that you might have of your family and the real nitty gritty that was happening behind the scenes? Of course. It's actually my profile picture of motherhood on all of my socials. Really? That picture reminds me to always be my true self and that a photo says absolutely nothing because that's a photo. It was my first photo shoot and it was with my four month old baby. It was so expensive and we were like so excited to do this at home. We all got dressed. We were all still sleep deprived. Um, Baby not sleeping through the night. But anyways, we were doing this photo shoot. We were so excited. Nicole was not having it like at all. And there was like no way to like you know, reshoot another day. It was too expensive. So we went with it and the photos came out spectacular. Oh my goodness. Like I had, I was like, this does not match the day that we went through. And so if you see my profile picture, it's like a really like kind of like angelic mom over daughter. Yes. yes. But in that moment, she looks like she's smiling. She's actually crying and I'm trying to comfort her. Oh, so it just, it, that, that just, it'll never change. It reminds me that pictures say nothing and that it's just a moment in time. And it's kind of how you uh, view it as a viewer. It's all an interpretation. And I'm, I'm so happy for you because I know what an investment it can be to set up a shoot like that. So I'm glad you got some good photos. Um, but Oh, that's, that is hilarious. Well, I'm so glad you shared that story because it's true. We so often look at other people's photos and interpret in our own minds, like everything must be perfect. But I've had shoots exactly like that, where you have to bribe a child with some candy to stop crying and just come and sit on my lap. Um, And those pictures are for us. They're not for the kids, but we want them so bad because our kids in that moment, they will never be that age ever again. They will never be exactly like that ever again. So we, as parents, we want that. And it's not like it's false because I know you've had those moments where you're gazing into your baby's eyes. It's just when you're put under the gun, under pressure (laughs) with a photographer and everything, you you just have to do you have to make, make the best of it. Um, Well, you have such a beautiful family and I can just tell by watching your content that there's so much love uh, in your home. Um, But as moms, we all have our own unique challenges, right? Like right now in in my phase of motherhood, um, I have seven kids. My oldest is 27. My youngest is 14. And my struggle is giving in and giving up too easily. (laughs) Like with my youngest, it's like, oh yeah, you can stay up. Oh, you don't have to do that. I said I would never do that, but honestly, I'm tired. And I do and I don't do as many fun things with him. Like, you know, he's just the youngest. He's just like basically raising himself. So yeah, yeah. I'm curious, what is your biggest struggle as a mom in this phase of your life? In this phase of my life, I think it's um that balance that we're all craving, like you said, trying to do the fun things, but also trying to mother our other children and um, make a business and like run a household and see your extended family and some have have some alone time Uh, and do self care and like the pile just keeps going up and up and up. And sometimes I like can't even fall asleep at night because I'm just like thinking of all of the to do list. Yeah. That is just like constantly running, 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 running that never actually gets done because you have to prioritize the things that you write that you can actually do in one day. So I think that that's my biggest struggle right now is trying to find balance. Yeah. Because that doesn't exist, right? Well, I think that running to-do list, right, as your head hits the pillow, that that happens to a lot of us. Um, I like to just get it out of my head, like write it down, type it up on my phone. So for some reason, that like that's like a little trick that allows my brain to just be like, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about that anymore. But you're right. You constantly have to decide like out of all of these like 100 good things, yes. what is highest priority? And if I ever get to the bottom of the list, great. But 
right. the world is not going to stop spinning if I don't get to That's the right. bottom. That's right. Um, and I have found that you there is no bottom. Like once you get to the bottom, you're like, oh, here's another list. Exactly. So it's like, it's it, it's all good things, thank God. But it's it's a, it's a lot, right? Yeah. Well, you especially have a lot on your plate. You have a million, over a million followers on Instagram, which is your business. I know it's a creative outlet and kind of it grew out of a passion that you have for, you know, playing with your kids. Um, yeah. If you don't already follow Miriam, go to Mother Could, follow her amazing play activities and recipes and mom hacks. Um, could you tell us really quickly, how'd you come up with that name, Mother Could? What does that mean? It's actually a really interesting story. So um, the whole sensory play love situation happened when my first daughter, Nicole, the same daughter in the picture, mm -hmm. <laughs> she had um, she refused to eat solids when she was a baby. So um, I would introduce solids and she would literally either spit them out or refuse to eat them completely. So about a year, but, but she was in the 90th percentile of weight and height because I was breastfeeding her. Okay. So the doctors would say, don't worry, she's fine. Don't worry, she's fine. But but now she turned one and she was still not eating a single solid. And so mm -hmm. I realized that she had a texture sensitivity because when we would go to the beach, we're in South Florida, we would go to the beach, she would not want to touch the sand. We would go sit on the park grass. She would not want to touch the grass. So it was kind of like a lot of signs. Mm -hmm. So then I uh, started making a lot of taste safe sensory play recipes. And I made everything under the sun, everything. I made uh, from Play-Doh to sand to um, grass textures to slime, anything that was edible for my daughter to be able to play with and feel the sensations in a playful way. Um, and in six months, she went, she started eating everything, she, quinoa and salmon and broccoli, like things that like, I was like, she is never going to eat these things. So it made a huge impact in our family. And that was um, my mother could moment. That was like my, I did it. Like my, I can't believe that I did this thing. Like I got her from eating nothing to eating all of these things. And just, it was just my mother could moment. And I, I, I wanted to start sharing this on social media because it was such a big breakthrough for our family. Um, so I turned to my husband, Mark, and I was like, I was like, what should I call it? And he was like, we should we should find a name that plays off of the word motherhood. And he was like, why don't you call it mother could? Because uh, you could do this. Yeah, I love that motherhood, mother could. Yeah, it was also around the time of um, like Scary Mommy, where a lot of the like uh, Scary Mommy moments were being taken like a joke, which were funny. But if you're in the moment, they're not so funny. Like, right. well, you'll never sleep again. <laughs> and I'm like, I'll never sleep again. <laughs> like, <laughs> they're not so funny. So I wanted something that was more like empowering for yeah. mothers. And so mother could. I'm so that. curious. How did you think to turn to sensory play as a way to overcome her like trouble eating solids? So I, my degree's in psychology and I actually right before, uh, right when I got pregnant with Nikki, actually, I was applying to get my PhD in child psychology. I was very passionate about it. Then I got pregnant and I was like, I want to be a stay-at-home mom. So that happened. But before, all throughout college, I worked for a center for children and families, uh, for children that had ADD and ADHD. And a huge focus for us was sensory play. And so I knew how to recognize the signs for somebody that had a texture sensitivity or that could use uh, sensory regulation or things like that. Um, so I recognize the signs and I just went with my gut. Yeah. So sensory play can help if your child is having trouble with different foods, but also ADD. What, what are some other things that might be like a sign that this is something that would be good for them? So any sort of like sensory regulation, for example, this is not for children that even have something like, let's say um, uh, your babies have trouble, like calming down before bedtime, like they're very like um, hyper or something like that. I make um, a lavender Play-Doh where I have a little tray by their bedside. 20 minutes before bed, they sit down and they want to, and they can play with lavender Play-Doh. And it's just like a calming force. It's like a sensory play basically um, 
you know, accumulates all of your sensory needs, right? So your visual, your uh, smell, your touch, everything to one place, rather than activities that, you know, focus on one singular thing, like uh, numbers or letters, or something like that. Sensory play is open ended. So it's up to the child's imagination, they have a piece of play doh, and um, some tools, what are they going to do with it? It's up to them. Yeah, but they are touching it, they are moving it, they are molding it, they are doing whatever they want with it. Sometimes even eating it. (laughs) Sometimes even eating it, which is why all my sensory play recipes are taste safe. Yeah. Um, And up to this day, my eight and five-year-olds literally will lick their hands after playing with sensory play. I'm like, okay, Okay. (laughs) what's happening? (laughs) It must taste good then. (laughs) Yeah, it's not that it tastes good. It's just that that's a child's like, innate right behavior yeah. is to taste everything um so yeah so sensory play is for everybody when i'm feeling stressed sometimes i will literally run my fingers through a rice sensory bin and mm-hmm. that right there that motion of running my fingers through it playing with it um hearing the sound of the rice like falling onto the other pieces of rice that is just a calming yeah. force so it's so, just yeah. it's, it's magical for everybody Oh, I, I love that so much. And you know what else I love? I love how all of your content is in English and Spanish. And yeah. that's because you are raising your family bilingually. bilingually. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I know I, when we were, when our kids were all little, they had a couple little friends who were being raised um, English. French and German. And every time we were around them, my husband and I would get so stressed because it's like these poor little kids are being yelled at in English by our kids and then in French by the mom and in German by the dad. And I was just like, their brains must be exploding. Like I can really handle it. Are there any like misconceptions about raising a a bilingual family that you want to debunk? Yes. It's not... It's not like um, you're get you're being sensory overload. It's not a sensory overload. It's kind of like the way that we um, teach our kids and that we were brought up is that you kind of learn everything at the same time. So it all so it almost seems seamless and the same. So when I speak to you in English, I can switch to Spanish within the same sentence mm-hmm. because my my brain, I guess, um, decodes both languages at the same time. That's and awesome. that's why when you hear me speaking in English, you don't hear an accent. When you hear me speak in Spanish, you don't hear an accent. Because I didn't learn one before the other. I learned pretty much both at the same time. Whereas my mom, you can tell right away, she has a very pronounced English, uh, Spanish accent in English. But she speaks French and she has no Spanish accent in French. Because she learned that at around the same time she was learning Spanish? She learned it before English. Oh, so the, okay. the, the after, I think that the more languages you learn, like the later ones are yeah. the ones that you have like more of an accent with, but the ones that are closer to your home language, like Spanish, French, Italian have the same sort of accent, uh-huh. um, whereas English is the most different. So for our kids, they they have been brought up with both things at the same time. With, and, and these, um, your your kids' friends were brought up with all three languages at the same time. So for them, it's it's the normal. Yeah. It's just my brain couldn't handle it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Because it's so different for you. Yeah. But for us, um, there's a very big misconception that kids that learn more than one language have speech delays. And in fact, it's not the case at all. Most um, kids that learn more than one language can actually say more words because they have a broader vocabulary. So, for example, it's much harder to say water than it is to say agua. Mm. So for our kids, they they might say agua, but they also might say hi instead of hola. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like they can expand their vocabulary much easier based on the words that are easier to say for them. So do they ever start mixing like yes. <laughs> a little yes. bit of Spanglish? It's just yes. all the time. <laughs> and it's, so cute. it's so cute. My biggest struggle right now is actually getting them to really speak Spanish because uh, even if, if Mark and I and our family speaks to them in Spanish the entire time at school, they speak English. Mm-hmm. So all of their friends, even if we're in South Florida, and the majority are Hispanic, not the majority, but a lot of them are Hispanic. Uh, they still speak English to each other. 
Hmm. Interesting. So it's amazing. My daughter-in-law, she, her mom is um, from the Philippines and her dad's from Puerto Rico and they, you know, they immigrated to the U S and when they had her, they just, they wanted to give her English. And so they purposely did not speak any of their native languages at home. And now she wishes that she, she had yeah. that skill. Um, but that was a deliberate choice. What if there, if there was someone who wanted to raise their children bilingually, what advice do you have to give them? Um, speak to them, speak to them in, in that language and don't put pressure. Like when I was learning English, um, my dad would say, but, but, but how do you say that in English? And he mm. wouldn't respond until I would say it in English. Mm. So what I do is a little bit different is I, they'll say something in English and I'll just repeat it in Spanish mm. right away. So they'll say like, um, can I have a cup of water? And I'll be like, ah, oh, quiero un vaso de agua right away so that they're constantly hearing the language yeah well so while they're little they might not want to but when they get a little bit older they'll very well understand the language and feel comfortable speaking it because they've been hearing it day in and day out over and over again so i think that it's really like anything it's practice if you're if it's out of practice you're not going to speak it but you just have to continue like training the brain to hear the language yeah. and Sometimes they'll say it in Spanish. Yeah. When my oldest was in preschool, we were living in Paris, France. And so he went to a little kindergarten there and he was picking up the language so fast and at the playground, always speaking French with his little um, copain on the, in the playground. Um, but then we moved back to the States and it was all English all the time. And so it kind of he kind of yeah. lost it. Yeah. Then when he was in college, he went to Tahiti to do some graduate work and it's all French. And I couldn't believe how fast he started picking it up. So mm-hmm. even if those seeds can be planted in those early yeah. years, and even if it, you get out of practice, there is still hope later because that yes. foundation has been laid. That's it's so very awesome. true. It's very true. Um, okay. is from Morocco and his family all speak French and they did the same thing. They didn't want the t- children to understand what they were saying. So they didn't teach any of our generation French. Oh, because they wanted a secret language. <laughs> they they wanted a secret language, but like, how lucky would I be to speak I three know. languages? I know. So oh, sad, ma'am. Okay, let's go back to sensory play because this, yes. this, I'm so fascinated by this because I didn't know anything about sensory play. But when my kids were little, I had a go-to Play-Doh recipe that I would make constantly at home because it was easy. It was cheaper. You know, you go buy Play-Doh and then they leave it out and you have to throw it away like the next day. And I'm like, this is, this is really dumb. I'm not doing this anymore. And a girlfriend gave me this recipe and I was like, my world changed. I, that was my go-to. And Play-Doh generally is pretty easy to contain. Doesn't make that big of a mess. I never did a rice bin, although I know my kids would have loved that. But the mess that I imagine that they would have made probably would have scared me off. So um, for people who have been watching your videos, I'm like, oh my gosh, my kids would love that, but they're terrified of the mess. Can you yeah. talk to us? How do you find the balance between creating sensory play opportunities and your sanity? <laughs> okay. So it's all in the setup. I always say you want to set yourself up for success, right? Yeah. A lot of the times, um, the, the thing with social media that is kind of annoying is that I can only put out a certain amount of content, right? So I yeah. could put out the Play-Doh recipe, but I can't put out the Play-Doh recipe plus how I set it up, plus what I did the cleanup, and plus like I can't do all that. It's too much for people to consume at the same time. So oftentimes I'll put a recipe in my feed, but then I'll go on my stories and show you how I set it up. So it's kind of annoying. And the setup is probably the most important part for you to want to do more sensory play recipes in the future. Okay. So if if we're doing a dry sensory base, oftentimes I see um, people in my community make sensory rice. They'll make a beautiful rice bin. They'll put it on the table and it's like a beautiful rainbow. Their child will put an elbow in the corner and the entire thing falls to the ground. Exactly what I imagine would happen in my house. <laughs> exactly. That's the that's the scenario, right? And everything's in slow motion, like, no! <laughs> and then rainbow rice going everywhere. So you got to start on the ground. You can't fall lower than the ground, right? Okay, yeah. But you got to set yourself up for success. You got to put a sheet down 
And that is your border. And that is where you tell your kids, these are the boundaries. Okay. If the rice goes beyond this area, the rice bin goes away. Okay. The first do time. You hold, do you stick to that? Like if you say. That is, that is the most important part. Okay. Once the rice goes beyond it, you take it away. And trust me, after you take it away two times, the third time, it doesn't go past that. But I imagine that boundary is big enough that it's yeah. doable, right? You're not giving them unrealistic. Exactly. Okay. We're doing. We're not doing a twin size sheet. We're doing like a you know queen folded sheet. We're okay. putting that down and we're putting a bin, a large bin, not a little tray that they have to like stay in a plate and like play in that little plate. No, we're doing a large storage bin, and there's your sensory rice, and we're using the lid as a tray. So now you have a large tray and a large bin, but You've made the rice and then it's kind of like giving somebody a steak, but they have never seen this before and they have no condiments. They have no cooking. They have nothing. They're going to look at the steak. They're probably going to smell it, throw it up in the air, slap it around a little bit and see what's going on with the steak, right? Yeah. But that's kind of like a, what a sensory base is. You need stuff to spice it up. So now you give your steak some condiments. You give it a knife to cut it, and you give it a, a frying pan and an oven. You're probably going to have a cooked steak. You're probably going to eat it. It's going to be delicious. Mm-hmm. So with sensory play, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to give them tools to play with. You're going to give them possibly even a theme. Maybe you do a, a blue rice sensory bin, and you're going to add some ocean animals. So now it is an ocean theme sensory bin, and you're going to give them cups. You're going to give them spoons. You're going to give them tongs. You're going to give them things to practice practical life skills with. Um, One of my favorite things about sensory play is how you can learn all these practical life skills through play that translate to real life. So if you give your three-year-old measuring cups for a rice bin, they'll start to look at the numbers on the measuring cup and be like, oh, that's a half a cup of rice. Um, or let's say you give your, actually on my, on my stories, on my Instagram stories yesterday, I posted about how my 11 month old daughter, I did her water bin for her. Her favorite thing to do with the water bin is to get in the water bin. I saw that. Yes, exactly. But if you notice the magic moment is when she grabbed the spoon by the handle, brought it up to her mouth and then pretended to put it back into the bin, grab some more water and put it back into her mouth. So that right there shows you that repetition and exposure to these tools at a young, early age really translates to the table. So when she goes um, to have her next meal, she'll grab the spoon correctly and know that that goes into her mouth hmm. the way that it goes and knows That's that awesome. it scoops. So it's, it's, it's those practical life skills that you're like, how do I teach my kid how to grab a spoon? How do I teach my kid how to write? How do I teach my kid how to even grab a pencil? How do I strengthen their hands so that they could use a scissors? All of these sensory play things like Play-Doh. Play-Doh is so good for strengthening little hands. Um, I had wrist surgery and part of my physical therapy was dough. I had to do all of these, squeeze the dough, push the dough. Yeah, exactly. So for for a kid to have enough um, finger muscles and hand muscles to hold a pencil correctly they need exposure to other things first. Yeah. So if you just send them to kindergarten without anything, they're going to get to kindergarten and not knowing what to do. And then they're like, oh, your child needs OT. Well, yes, that makes sense, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like all the preventative in a fun, fun way. Fun yeah. way to do it. Well, last month um, I chatted with Ginny of A Thousand Hours Outside, and she was talking about how unstructured unstructured playtime outside is so good for preparing fine motor large motor skills yeah. and these little bodies grow and develop by spending time outside adventuring and i'm hearing that same thing um come from from what you're sharing here like yeah. playing in a rice bin or with play-doh like it has amazing benefits yeah. and it doesn't have to be expensive because you can just get the spoons and cups out of your kitchen. You can mix up ingredients in your kitchen. And um, so it feels super accessible. And with your hacks about the sheet and the bins, the mess isn't going to be too much. But I have to say, when I saw your daughter get in that bin, it was red water that you had dyed with beet juice powder, right? Did that stain her clothes? Nope, not at all. Not at all. 
just because it's so diluted or extremely diluted and it's also a natural coloring beet okay. juice you have yeah. to think if you get beet juice onto your clothing it'll come out yeah. um actually i've never had any staining from food coloring or natural colors the only color that came super close was turmeric and that was because i uh i was a recipe that i was trying out and i dyed play sand with turmeric and i added too much turmeric yeah and that is the only time where i had a slight staining on a piece of sh- on a shirt yeah. otherwise but- i've never had staining on anything but I do know from following you that you've got like a very extensive list of cleaning hacks. Yes. <laughs> Pretty much follow Miriam and you can figure out how to get anything out of anything. <laughs> yes. Permanent <laughs> marker off your walls, couch, whatever. So even yes. if you do get a stain, I'm, I know you know how to take care of it. Yes. Um, I actually well, made um, Motherhood in Your Pocket, which is like a digital resource. And it, I put everything in there. I have a, a, a section for a cleaning hacks. I have a section for setting up for sensory play. I have a section for cleanup for sensory play or activities in general. I have 60 plus sensory play recipes. I, I was like, I don't have another place where I could do something like this. So I just created it. And it's been awesome. The so feedback has been amazing. Is it an app then? It's an app that people can download? It's not an app. It's just like a, it's a website that you log into your own okay. username, um, but you can make it into an app if you have like those um, smart, everybody has a smartphone, uh-huh. but you could like, if you have, have you ever tried making a website, an app, Yeah. you like press it and then it just goes, you can make it into an app, mm-hmm. but what I like about it is that you don't have downloads. Um, so you could open it from anywhere. You can open it from your desktop. You can open it from your iPad, uh, your tablet, anywhere. There's no yeah. download necessary. So you basically just create a little quick le- web link shortcut that you put exactly. an icon on your phone. If you want to. Yeah. Otherwise, you could just uh, web search it and you'll find it. Okay. So you can scroll the Motherhood Instagram to find all this good stuff or go to – what? what is the URL for that? Uh, motherhood.com. You'll find okay. it motherhood.com for all the good stuff, the cleaning hacks, the recipes. Hey, I want to get your take on, because even as I was scrolling, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so many cool things to do here. But which ones would be your go-to? If someone's just starting this for the first time, which activities, which recipes give you the most bang for your buck? Like your top three. Top three. Okay. Number one, Play-Doh, obviously. Yeah. You got to make Play-Doh. Play-Doh lasts a really long time, lasts over six months. It's so fun to make. It's made with using things you probably already have at home. Um, And it's fun. You can add glitter if you want to. You can add essential oils if you want to. You could do so many things with it. Mm -hmm. Um, So Play-Doh. Number two, I'm obsessed with my kinetic sand recipe. I created it from scratch. Now it's been knocked off many times, but (laughs) um, it's a compliment because it is very Good. My okay. kinetic sand recipe is taste safe. It's not. It's not exactly like store bought kinetic sand. Obviously, there's nothing synthetic in it. It's all um, pantry items like mm-hmm. baking soda and things like that. Um, it's a really fun recipe and it lasts for over a year. Oh wow! So it'll last you a really, really, really long time. So if you want that texture. Mm-hmm. Let's say you're, uh, yeah, if you want that texture, you can make it all sorts of different colors. If you make it white and leave it in the freezer or the fridge for a little while, it kind of feels like snow. Oh, um, cool. so it's a really, really fun recipe. Um, and then I think my, my daughters, for some reason, they love to make, um, mess free tie dye. And the way that you do that is with, um, paper towels, rubber bands, and, uh, washable markers and a little spray bottle of water. Yep. You basically just like, you know, uh, fold your paper, t- paper towel, color it in. Uh, sorry, fold your paper towel, put in rubber bands like you would a shirt or pants. And then you color it in a little bit with the washable markers, spray it with water, open it up. And it's like a paper towel tie dye. And they're, they love, they could do that all day. They love it. Very cool. Because sometimes I see these recipes and, you know, like you said, you got to make the setup, you got to get, set yourself up for su- success. And then I think, how long would my kid actually <laughs> spend here? Like, it, okay. do, you, do your different, do your children have different, like, things that they love or attention spans? Are there some things that work for some? Like, as as parents are trying out some of these new things, is it going to yeah. be normal for them to have maybe one be a fail? 
Yes, of course. Many times. And many times, um, uh, my kids will look at something and be like, oh, I'm not interested. And I'm, okay, great. But I'll leave it out. And it always, always, always come back to it when they are ready. Okay. It's like teaching a child to love broccoli. You have exactly. to expose them to it for a while. Exactly. And then maybe they'll start nibbling on it. That's and- right. But to me, the most, the most important part for, I think, a parent and child, caregiver and child, where a connection forms is during the creation of the sensory play recipes. I don't want parents to create them on their own. I don't want moms to spend their uh, nighttime making Play-Doh so that in the morning the child could play with a Play-Doh. That, oh, I don't yeah. want that to happen. I want the morning to be spent mother-child, dad-child, caregiver-child making the sensory play recipes together. Ah, uh, yeah. So when your child only plays with the Play-Doh for five minutes, you spend about 20 minutes together making it. And Uh that's where the magic happens. That's where the connection is. That's where the love happens. That's where your moment that it it has been a moment for me and my kids to really connect on something that we all have interest in where I can go down to their level and they can come up to my level. Um, where, it probably makes them feel proud that they they're helping create this thing and then they're more invested in it. So maybe they'll spend a little more time. Definitely. Once they've already made it, they see the final results. They're like, can you play with it? Can you play with it? And then they play with it for a little while. Um, good part about my recipes is that, like I said, they last for a really long time. So if they played with it for five minutes, maybe tomorrow they'll play with it for an hour or six months from now, they'll decide to play with it for a half an hour. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's so good. It's valuable. Um, you mentioned that your recipes, you use ingredients that you probably have in your pantry already. And I immediately thought of my Play-Doh making days and how I used to have to special order giant things of cream of tartar because that was an important ingredient in my Play-Doh recipe. And I, you know, at the grocery store, they sell these little teeny tiny cans. And I'm like, no, I need like 10 of those. Um, Do you, is there somewhere that you have linked where you get your supplies? Like, yes, definitely. I have an Amazon shop. So if you Google mother could Amazon, you'll find my Amazon shop and there's a whole section that says sensory play. Mm-hmm. And in that section, I have like recommended tools, my favorite food coloring, um, cream of tartar, flour, all of the things that you could possibly need. I am a, also a big believer on like looking for what you have and then matching what you have to what you want to make. So I, one of the frustrating things for me when I became a parent is like, I want to do activities. And then I go on the websites and I go on the blogs and I go on Pinterest. I look at the supply list and I have nothing. Yeah. So then I spend hours and hours looking through things that look attractive. And I'm like, I can't make any of this. I need to go to Michael's and buy the entire Michael's. <laughs> um, so for me, I think it's really important to look. You'll be like, okay, so I have some extra flour. I probably have some salt. Definitely have a little bit of oil. Uh, maybe I don't have cream of tartar, but Miriam has a workaround around that. So I can still make Play-Doh. Yeah. So it's kind of like, look at what you have. And then if you want to complement that with other things, like you're like, okay, let's try the Play-Doh now with cream of tartar. I'll order the cream of tartar. Or um, if you want some tools, you want tools for the sensory play to practice all these sorts of life skills um, in a safe way. Or if you want the best food coloring or like one of my things is like order the food coloring. The food coloring is the one thing that's going to make your stuff pop. Mm, nice. And that's going to be more attractive. Yeah. I tried a... Plato recipe once with Jello that was supposed to add the coloring and the scent and everything, and it was an epic fail. So epic skip fail. <laughs> skip the Jello recipe. Yeah. Go go to Miriam's website. Use her recipes. Um, Miriam, you, I love how you were reminding us that connection can happen in the preparation. And if I'm being honest with myself, like I, I love my kids and I do care deeply about making connection, but I'm not one of those moms who plays with their kids. So I would probably be more likely to, you know, get excited about making the Play-Doh than I would be playing with the Play-Doh. Yes. And when I was raising my kids, we were really lucky because my best friend lived exactly next door and she had kids the exact same ages of mine and she was the opposite. She loved playing. Well, I don't know if she loved it, but she did it. <laughs> you know, would play like hair salon and pet shop it. and like all day long. So my kids would go over there and they would get their their fix. Um, totally. Um, but I know I kind of carried around a little bit of guilt about that. 
Yeah. Um, my mom wasn't the kind to get like on the floor and play with us. She believed in what she called parallel play. She yeah. was always working on a project that she cared about. And then we'd be right there next to her doing Legos or playing with our dolls. Yeah. Um, what do you say to moms who are like, this isn't me. I'm not this kind of mom. I would say that's me. I do not like to play with my kids. I, I, it's, it, it's not one of my fortes. I do not like the, um, sitting down on the ground and playing the hair. So I don't like them to touch my hair. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. It's not my thing. And that is why I involve them in the making of these things because they come to my level and I get to their level. You know what I mean? We've found something in common that we all really like. So it's not like kids play. It's still kind of like making chicken, but you're not making chicken. You're making sensory play recipes. Yeah. Um, and that excites me. And that really excites them. Um, I have also found ways to incorporate them in projects that I really like. Like um, they love to help me in the kitchen. Love to help me in the kitchen. And if they're not helping me in the kitchen, they're killing each other. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> You have a job for dinner and you have a job for dinner. And I give them each a job for dinner. One cuts the cucumbers and the other one cuts the tomatoes. So, so good. On and so forth. So I've kind of like found that balance. And I've also set up my home for my kids to thrive with independent play. So basically my play areas are all set up where the kids can grab whatever they want when they want it, but also be nowhere to put it back when they're done with it. Okay. Every that's like a whole other topic, but it's basically uh, like all of the um, like the home edit containers and like Marie Kondo and like all of these things are designed for the adult mind, yeah. um, not for the child's mind. So we're like, let's make all of this so beautiful, so great, but the child has no idea where the balls are or like where are the dolls or anything. So they always need to go to the parent to ask for these things. Yeah. Rather than involving them in that process, they know where it is and they know where to put it back. Um, and materials that are safe for them to pull off of cabinets so that they won't like fall on them or hurt hurt them. Um, so yeah, I've really found things that are a lot of open ended toys like play silks, um, magnetic tiles, uh, blocks, dolls, art supplies. We have a whole art table. Things for them to just go and play independently with each other or by themselves. Um, and they really enjoy it. They really enjoy it. I, I can honestly say I, if I play with my kids once a month, wow. that's a lot. That I feel so validated. Yes. We, we don't need to be, we don't need to play with our kids. They, they play with themselves. That's actually what we want. We want them to have that independence and be able to exercise their creativity. And, um, did you say play silks? Yeah. That's one of the things. Yeah. Oh, I remember seeing those in catalogs. I'm old enough that we used to have to buy things from stores or catalogs. I love it. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, that looks so cool. Um, Cause that allows them to like, they can use them as costumes or yeah. as like a blanket, like that yeah. creative, just open-ended. Open-ended play. Yes. Okay. So what's your philosophy on then toys, like traditional toys? Because, um, you know, when I first have started having kids, I wanted the things that I had growing up, Legos and blocks and dolls and like more open-ended stuff. Of course, as a child, I always was envious of like the Barbie dream house, but I never could get the Barbie dream house. Of course. Um, do you have a philosophy um, yes. on toys that you want to share with us? Yes. Uh, Barbie dream house is a dream, but nobody actually plays with the Barbie dream house. That is the thing that we have to remind ourselves when we are like, oh, I wish I could get this amazing um, LOL mansion for my daughter, but I can't afford it. The truth is it's going to be a wow factor, but they're not going to play with the LOL wow well, mansion. Mm -hmm. So the things that I always say that you want to invest in are the things that are going to be ageless and generational. Mm. Blocks, not even so much Legos. So I feel like Legos has changed so much that Legos is like kits. And if you make something that's done, but our type of Legos where they were just like, make whatever you want with it. We just had a giant pile. That's like right. there were no kits, no instructions. We that's would create right. our own things. That's, that's right. Now it's all kits. Um, magnetic tiles. Oh, yeah. So the good. best, the best art supplies. Get an art table. Um Yes, they're going to have things here and there that you're like, you're going to get for like birthdays 
and like special like Christmas things, Hanukkah things. So it's like, yes, but they're not going to enjoy it as much. Those are toys that they are going to play with for a short period of time and then never look at it again. I am big on toy rotations. And this is when I take advantage of those toys where they're wow factors but don't grab a lot of attention for a lot of time. And I rotate the toys. So in their play space, I'll have um, uh, some toys that are in uh, three fourths of the toys are in storage. One fourth of the toys are out and every so on and so forth. I will rotate those toys in and out so that when these toys, they're no longer play with them, put them in storage. The ones in storage come back out. They feel brand new without you spending any money. Yeah. Um, we and do. it helps helps you keep your toy room probably under control too. Less That's clutter. Right. Less so clutter. Smart. That's right. And it also um, is a great opportunity for you to realize if your child, you brought it out now four times, they haven't even looked at it, it goes for donation and so on and yeah. so forth. Smart. Well, you know, actually with my kids being all grown up and older, we, um, when we just did a little remodel in our house, what used to be the toy room, the playroom is now a music studio. And I either got rid of the toys or saved them. And when I think about the ones that I saved, thinking that my grandchildren might enjoy these, it was the Legos, the blocks, the dolls. I have this set of play food that my kids all used just for a million things. And dress-ups. Yep. Because that that feels timeless and encourages that open-ended creative play. Yeah. And those are the things that they that they play with. That is a true, truly the only things that they play with are these items. Yeah. The other things, yeah, they might play with for a little bit. And you're like, oh, she loves the dog that barks. Yeah. But the dog that barks is, you know. Right. Goes out well, of- there's there's also so much peer pressure to get the, the trendy toys because like all their friends are getting it. But my advice would be resist the urge. Let all their friends get the trendy toys and they go over and play with them and then they get their fill. <laughs> That's right. And invest in good, timeless stuff. That's right. So and good. I promise you when their friends come to your house, they're going to be like, wow, this is so fun. I never want to leave. So oh. it's like. A win-win. It is a win-win. Yeah. Well, you share so many amazing things online. And as I was watching your videos just recently, I the thought crossed my mind. Does she ever get tired of sharing all this stuff? Obviously, you got started because you had this big unlock, aha, and you knew other moms need this kind of encouragement and and resources. But how long have you been doing it? And how long, like, what's the game plan? (laughs) Okay, so I actually um, did it for six months when I had that aha moment. And I was like, forget this. This is way too much work. It's a lot of work. It is. It consumed my entire day. It paid absolutely nothing. And I was like, I'm not doing this. So then I was pregnant again, moving houses. I did all that. And now Emma, my second daughter, was born. She was about nine months old. I was still doing all these sensory play recipes with her because I was not going to have that happen again. (laughs) And I was like, you know what? Let me just pick this back up again. And when I picked it back up again, I said that I was going to do it my way and only my way. And I was going to start creating more video content, something that was quick, easy for me to do pictures. Imagine taking a picture of a child who is playing with sensory rice. It is hard to make that beautiful. (laughs) And make it, it's literally impossible for for them to not get like a moving hand in a picture. Mm -hmm. So I was like, that was the part of my biggest problem. That was what everybody was doing. And I really thought I needed to make a blog and I was going to be a blogger and I needed to do all these things that other people were doing. And that was consuming me. This time I came on and I was going to do things my way. Forget the blog because I don't even read blogs. Yeah. And I do things my way. So if I want to share, I share. If I don't want to share, I don't share. Yes, there is that constant pressure to like put out new content and like keep the audience engaged and do all these things. But I try to stay away from that. If I post once a week, great. If I don't post at all, that's fine too. Like it is what it is. I'm very active on stories because it's very easy. It's Mm -hmm. just um, like a vlog of my day. If I want to share about it, I do. If I don't, I don't. And um, it's like a no pressure type of situation. Yeah. Um. And yeah, I'm, I'm across all social media platforms too. So, you know, TikTok, Facebook, Pinterest, 
So trying to keep up with all that is, is, is a lot. It's a lot of pressure. Well, your authenticity really does come through. And I think that's why your audience has grown so much. And um, one of my life mantras is done is better than perfect. Yes. Something is better than nothing. And I feel like you exemplify that. You're doing so many good things with your kids, but you're showing us like real life ways to, you know, have, have these connecting moments um, and sharing your mom hacks for traveling with kids. Yeah. So many good tips on traveling with kids, how to yeah. get stains out. Um, I recently saw some stories that you did with your husband about how to use credit card points to travel. Yes. I'm like, yes, you touch on all of it. It's, <laughs> awesome. it's I think you, you are such a fun follow. Thank you. Um, I really want to add value. I feel like there's been a lot of, um, this upswing with like TikTok for like craft accounts and they make things out of like recycled materials that are just not useful is mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Like it's going to waste parents times. Mm -hmm. so for me, it's, I really, what I put out there, I really want it to be a moment where you're like, okay, this was valuable for me. Yeah. And I the really act did this. And the activity isn't about creating like a picture perfect, That's like, right project that you, That's you know, right. it's, it's about the experience and it might get messy. It might actually look ugly in the end, but yeah. it's about the experience and the doing. That's right. So good. Okay. Well, thinking about all of the photos and videos and everything you must take, have to take to, to keep, you know, your content coming. Um, let's pivot the conversation to photos and videos. Yes. <laughs> and can you just, do you have your phone with you? Yes. Well, it would be fun sure. to take out our phones and look and see how many photos do you have on your camera roll? Because chat oh. books were all about helping families hold on to their memories. But oh, wow. I have 54,000 photos on my phone and there's no way I'm holding on to all of those. What about you? How many photos do you have? 61,790. Yes. Oh my God. But 34,000 videos. 34,000 videos. Okay. I have 8,000 because oh, that's your, God. that's your medium. That's your, your artistic expression, but that is a lot of content and that could be so overwhelming, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. That's a lot. It's a lot. So tell me, do you have any habits or life hacks for organizing and enjoying no. your family? Memories? No. no? None. I have zero because I used to be really good. Like I used to be like, I'm going to put these, my favorite pictures in this family album of this trip. And it's going to be that I lost control. Yeah. And now I don't know how to bring it back. It's happened to all of us. And I, my best piece of advice is start today and do better going forward. And eventually when you have a lot of extra time on your hands. I don't know when that'll be because I still I haven't found that time. Then you can go back and work backwards. Work backwards. But I started something years ago where every Sunday, I call it my Sunday select, I would go through that week's photos and videos, delete the garbage, select the ones that were the best of the best and give them that little heart favorite. And then if I was really feeling ambitious, you know, move photos into albums. Like I had an album for each of my kids, an album with the best pictures of my husband and I. Um, but, and, and I will admit like there are some weeks where I get behind and then all of a sudden it's like really hard because I'm like, oh, I have to go through two weeks now. So it's that like little bit with consistency has made the biggest difference for me. Because, I love this tip. Because there it's, it's stressful because you know, like all of your cherished memories are right here. And at the very least, you should be backing up to the cloud yes. on a hard drive. You do that too, right? Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Because that's for sure. We can't lose all There's documentation. A lot of garbage. There's, There's a lot of garbage. Yes. There's a lot totally. of garbage. Oh my gosh. Um, one of the things we talk about at Chatbooks is how there are obviously these big milestones that happen in our families, right? Graduations, birthdays. Oh, speaking of birthdays. Share your birthday tradition because I've seen you post this several <laughs> times. You have a really cute, fun photo birthday tradition. Yes, yes. I since my um, kids were one, we always do a giant balloon of their number. So one, two, three, four, five, um, and we choose a different color for each of them. So we have gold for Nikki, silver for Emma, and Ariana is going to be one soon. I think we're going to do pink. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so cute to see how they grow in comparison to the giant balloon. Yeah. Aww. It's so cute to see. I love that. Well, so there are those big milestones, right? First birthday. You know, of course, you're going to document that. 
But throughout our days, often our busy, crazy, chaotic, chaotic days, there are little magical moments that can go by without us even noticing. But for me, the practice of taking a photo of that, it's become like my gratitude practice, my gratitude journal. And it helps me appreciate like moments that might not be Instagram worthy, you know, might not be the thing that you want to blow up and hang on your wall for years and years to come, but yes. little magical moments in time that I want to hold on to that, yes. that defines what motherhood Amazing. is for me and, yeah. and our family life. Yeah. So we call them, um, are the everyday magic moments. And I'm wondering that. if there is an everyday family moment that feels magical to you that you have captured in a photo recently. I think it's the, oh, individually I have for every child but it, my mornings with my baby I always take like a little picture and it's just oh, us you yes. know and it's like special because they're never going to be that little ever again yeah. um so I think those would be like the most like current magic moments for us that are just like they're normal yeah with it wasn't until my fourth baby was born that digital cameras became the norm and it wasn't until my seventh that we all had them on our phones in our oh, pockets yeah, so yeah I have so many more photos of my youngest child than I have of my oldest. And I wish that I, you know, you don't, not going to break out your big, you know, SLR to take that magical moment, you know, morning with your baby. So it's such a blessing to have these amazing cameras in our pockets, but to keep from us losing our minds and getting overwhelmed and then having those moments be lost in your camera roll of 60,000. Yes. That is why that is why we invented month books. It allows you to choose 30 photos every month right from your camera roll. I just you download the chatbooks app, you choose month books, it pulls up um August and then it just shows you all of your August photos and then you just tap on the 30 That's that so you cool. love and yeah. then print them and then your kids have something to hold on to and reflect and stories to talk about. Yeah. Um, it's been the hugest blessing of my life to to be able to create this product. And it's That's been a huge so blessing cool. for our family because it's about the little things. It is. Little, little things that build and build and create beautiful, strong families. It is. The, the few photo books that we do have, my kids love to flip through them. They love to flip through them. Yeah. It's really cute. They love seeing pictures of themselves. All right, Miriam, we got to get you set up on month books. We'll, we'll make yeah. sure that happens. Yeah. Well, at the Mom Force, we're all about supporting and cheering each other on through mom life, through the ups and downs, the hard stuff, the good stuff. Do you have a go to mom tip or a bit of encouragement for us as we close this interview? I think it's to um, let go of all your expectations. Amen. About everything <laughs> and just, just just go with it just go with it no one knows no one knows what they're doing that is the the biggest secret is that literally no one knows what they're doing your expectations are meaningless yeah. and things will happen as they happen so you might want to have a plan or something like that but don't expect things to go a certain way because when you expect things to go a certain way and they don't go that way you become disappointment so you're setting yourself up for disappointment when you build that expectation in the first place. I could not agree with that more. That is the big aha unlock of my motherhood journey. Yes. In fact, there's a quote I heard years ago that the fewer expectations you have for how people will behave, the happier you will be. A hundred percent. And I've heard that in the context of like losing my mind that the kids' towels were on the floor again. Like, how many times have I told you to hang up your wet towels? Like, I made it mean something about me. And then in that moment, I was like, it's not about me. Who cares? I'm going to keep telling them whether they hang them up or not. It's all good. It was just that like, is right. And to that just right. still be happy, even though things aren't perfect. That's right. Um, like, why? Why do we need that to happen in that moment? Like, why is that our expectation? Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, so, so good. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing so many amazing things with us and sharing your life so fully. Um, So you mentioned we can go to motherhood.com. You can follow motherhood on Instagram. Anything else you want our audience to know? Um, I think that's it. Just try, just try something, start somewhere. If you're looking for a connection with your child in a different way, start somewhere. You never know where it'll take you. Play-Doh is a good place to start. It is. Awesome.
about it. Well, thank you so much. You're amazing. Thank you. Thank really you. appreciate it. <laughs>